Welcome to Chautauqua People. I'm John V. My guest today is Tim Rangelian. He serves as chairman of the Chautauqua Foundation. Tim grew up in Washington, D.C., and then he graduated from the University of Virginia. He joined Arthur Anderson Accounting Firm and worked his way up to partner, only to watch the company close following a catastrophe. Eventually, he made his way to FTI, a public company that specializes in helping clients during crises events. The focus of Tim's activities is with healthcare companies. He has worked with the same core group of people uh, in various settings for 25 years. Tim, how did you make your way to Chautauqua? Well, thanks, John, and I'm glad to be here. Um, my wife and I had heard about Chautauqua for a long time. Our minister in Atlanta, George Worth, had a place here and used to speak from the pulpit pretty regularly about his experiences at Chautauqua. He would write a lot of his sermons here. It was just sort of a regular part of, of his dialogue. So everyone in our church kind of knew about it. And one year, it was 2000, Leslie and I asked George if we could rent their cottage for a week of that summer season. Uh, we ended up coming week nine of the 2000 season. And if you know the season at all, week nine is usually not a lot of young families. It's mainly an older crowd then. The weather can be a little bit dodgier. So we were here with our three young daughters who were five, three, and one at that point, had pulled the, the five-year-old out of kindergarten to come up here. And uh, it was a rainy, kind of cold week. We were the only young people there, but we still just had a fabulous time. And um, resolved then and there that we'd come back the next season for two weeks, and we came three weeks the season after that, and then eventually bought a house. How long do you customarily stay at Chautauqua during the summer? Well, my wife and kids have usually stayed for the entire summer. School in Atlanta starts back a little bit earlier than in New York, so we might have to leave in weeks after week seven or eight of the season. Um, and I would typically come back and forth on weekends and usually for two or three full weeks during the season. Mm -hmm. This year, of course, is a little bit different with COVID. And what are your plans for this year? Um, a little bit undefined right now. You know, Atlanta is, is a hot mess at the moment with COVID and, and um, the protests in the streets and all of that. And it's just the normal hot summer weather in Atlanta. So we've been here for two and a half weeks now. Um, we got up here just before Governor Cuomo put in the quarantine on people coming in from Georgia. So we squeaked in under the wire. Um, and we're going to probably stay at least two more weeks and we're going to play it by ear after that. And it's really a function of how effectively I can work remotely and you know how the situation is up here. Do the kids have enough to do in this year? They do. Um, so my older two are now out of college and have their own careers. And so one is here right now actually working from home in Chautauqua. And our youngest is a rising senior in college. So she's with us right now, but she's going to be going back to Providence in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Goes to Brown or Providence College? Yeah, she goes to Brown, yeah. I have a niece. Oh, nice. Alumna. Yeah. Uh, tell me about your, shift gears a little bit, tell me about your nature of your work at FDI. Sure. Um, for the last 15 years or so, I've been pretty exclusively focused um, in healthcare. Actually, gosh, almost 20 years now. Um, and in the healthcare sector, if you think about, you know, the, the, the nature of healthcare in the U.S., it's a very highly regulated business, lots of money, lots of change, both in terms of reimbursement systems and technologies. New legislation comes out all the time. And in the face of all that, healthcare organizations, whether they're hospitals, drug companies, medical device companies, insurers, all struggle one way or another to just keep up with all of those regulations. And so most of those organizations are either in the midst of some sort of regulatory compliance problem that they're trying to address, or they're trying to stay out of trouble in the first place and get things right, to put in the right compliance structures and, and protocols and disciplines to, to do things correctly. And my work centers on, on all of that, either helping organizations put in the right compliance programs to stay out of trouble, or when they find problems, uh, helping them to deal with those, to investigate them, to figure out how to resolve them and how to prevent them from happening again. Where do most of these regulations come from? You know, there's, there's a wide range. I mean, m most of the, the regulatory work is driven by the federal government, so the Medicare program, which plays such a big role in U.S. health care. And then, of course, the federal government has a big role in state Medicaid programs as well. So those two programs, and to a lesser extent, the, the military uh, health care program, TRICARE, the Federal Employee Health Benefits Program, and others, also drive some of the regulatory complexity. Um, but it's really Medicare and Medicaid that drive the most. I'm surprised you didn't mention Joint Commission. Well, Joint Commission um, is an accrediting agency, and, and they are more 
involved in looking at quality of care issues and whether uh, healthcare organizations uh, are up to the appropriate standards to begin with from a care standpoint. So that does play a role as well because the regulations that we're talking about affect every aspect of the business, how care is provided, the quality of that care, staffing levels, financial issues, billing and coding issues, everything that, that healthcare organizations do. I'm, I'm glad we sort of separated what some of these do that are different. Now tell me about what the effect of the current COVID pandemic is on the, the healthcare industry. Wow, it's a great question because it's, it's really been profound. I mean, if you think first about um, sort of community level healthcare providers, so your, your local community hospital say, um, whether you're in a, a smaller town or in some place like New York City or Miami, you know, all of those hospitals have had to essentially stop providing elective care services. So elective surgeries, things that aren't emergencies that a patient may need at some point, but they don't need right now coming in in an ambulance. Those services, because they're discretionary, have stopped entirely. And that's where hospitals make most of their money. Where they're all focusing right now is just dealing with this massive influx of COVID patients. So people coming in through the emergency department, people who need to be in the ICU or on ventilators. So lots of resources, lots of space in the hospitals is being channeled to take care of COVID patients, um, which don't necessarily reimburse. These hospitals are obliged to take care of sick patients whether or not they have insurance. And the federal government has stepped in to help with some of that. Um, but the areas where the hospitals make their money have really been at a standstill. So financially, hospitals are really hurting right now. Um, COVID's also impacted staffing. So you've got health givers, nurses, physicians, who might not normally be on the front lines of patient care, who might be otherwise treating orthopedic patients or you know, gastroenterology patients, are now pulled into the fray to help deal with COVID patients. And it's stressful, it's a change from what they're used to doing. And especially in the face of a disease that isn't fully understood yet, it's challenging. They don't know what the right protocols are to take care of six patients. So you've got financial pressures, you've got personnel and caregiver pressures that are really creating a firestorm for most hospitals. I've been surprised that we've heard that the elective surgeries were, elective procedures were canceled. And, and what do you think the outcome of that will be? You know, at, at some point, the expectation is that that volume has to catch back up. So just because somebody can't get their knee replaced now while COVID's going on, doesn't mean they won't need to get their knee replaced at some point, right? So. Hospitals are trying to now figure out, as those patients are able to come back in, as hospitals reopen, how do we maintain that flow of patients through? Because patients that would have been coming in over the last four months are gonna be stacked up against patients that would be coming in in the ordinary course now and going forward. And so the, the question is, how can hospitals maximize that throughput to catch back up on the backlog of, of elective patients? while also taking care of current patients and still now dealing with the spike in COVID cases. So it's a complex logistical challenge and one that's really straining the infrastructures of most hospitals. I've been surprised that they haven't played a little, little closer. We've seen some hospitals, I think someone, I got name someone in Buffalo if I had, who had big layoffs. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't suggest that their census is high. And um, like somebody didn't quite figure this one out, that the hospitals would be hurt and let's, let's if the census goes up, then you immediately put the brakes on the elective side. Yeah, well, that's right. And, and the thing is that, you know, hospitals in this country had really been sort of fine-tuned to normal levels of patient care activity. So they could predict with a pretty high degree of accuracy how many angioplasties would come through, how many knee and hip replacements would come through. And so hospitals were built to handle those normal circumstances in a really efficient way. So there weren't unused operating rooms and there weren't unused MRI machines. Well, COVID has completely changed that dynamic. Now they, they have a completely different mix of patients who are coming in. So the clinicians that they have available, the resources they have available, the infrastructure is built for a completely different set of activities than what they're actually experiencing right now. Mm -hmm. And how is this um, stress on the healthcare industry in the United States differ from what's happened in Western Europe? East Asia? Well, um, some of that's yet to play out. I mean, as you know, the, there are real differences in healthcare you know, between the U.S. And, and most other, say, Western European countries. And you know, there they have government-run systems. Um, there's generally been a stronger response by central governments in Europe to help manage the COVID crisis. 
And because it's the government who's paying all the costs, there's um, a little bit more ability for the government to respond directly to, to um, help take account of, of the change in patient demographics. In the U.S., it's a little bit tougher because we have this hodgepodge system, right? We have for-profit and not-for-profit hospital systems. We have varying degrees of government involvement in those hospitals. So there, it's more difficult to have a uniform response. And we'll see how that plays out on the back end. I mean, there's always the question of whether governments can manage health care as efficiently or more efficiently than for-profit entities, for example. Um, and I think this will be a real test of how those different models work in the face of an unprecedented crisis. Has it, the European situation been similar to East Asia? Um, I, I think, you know, somewhat different just in terms of how the, the crisis has unfolded. Um, but there are still, you know, a lot of challenges um, in Western Europe, just as there are in Asia. And, you know, it's continuing to unfold just when we think we've sort of got a handle on where things are, you know, the, the disease spikes up again in some new way. So it remains to be seen, frankly. Mm -hmm. Let's shift gears a little bit. What is the Chautauqua Foundation? The foundation um, is, is a close affiliate of Chautauqua Institution, but a separate legal organization. And it maintains the endowment funds that exist to support the operations of the institution. Why, why aren't they in the one place? Well, that, that's a great question. There's a historical reason for that. So in a lot of organizations, you will see the endowment just being part of the overall organization. So mm -hmm. in many colleges or universities, for example, there's not a separate endowment organization that supports the school, but they are one and the same. Mm -hmm. um, Chautauqua has a, a unique history with some financial difficulties in its past. And so, you know, coming out of a financial crisis in the 30s, the decision was made to put the endowment assets in a separate organization so that if there were financial problems with the institution, if the institution had to file for bankruptcy, say, the, the notion was that the body of the endowment would be maintained intact and could be used to reseed a new Chautauqua in the footprint of, of the old one that, you know, may have had problems. So it was really meant as a mechanism for preserving the ongoing functioning of the institution in some form. Has that strategy seemed to be successful? In you know, fortunately, since that construct was set up, we haven't had to, to face that challenge. Um, but I will tell you that, you know, in the midst of the COVID crisis and the impact that's had on Chautauqua's season this year and on Chautauqua's finances, um, it was the first time in my experience that having this bifurcated setup um, started to take on some deeper meaning. You know, if, if we, God forbid, got to the point where the institution were having serious financial difficulty and were faced with bankruptcy, um, having those endowment assets set aside, protected, and at the ready to help continue the mission of the, of the institution would be a huge benefit. What is the size of the endowment? It's about $100 million now, give or take. We had, we had gotten just above $100 million you know, earlier this year. COVID then took a big whack at it. It's fortunately rebounded a good bit since then, so we're just shy of $100 million today. And how's the payout? The payout, it, we, it, it varies a little bit. We aim typically for sort of a you know, roughly 5%, uh, but we don't have a, a strict formula that says it's 5% of X each year. Mm -hmm. But that's roughly where it's averaged. So this year, you know, give or take, we were looking at a, a payment uh, payout to the institution of about $5 million. Within that, though, it's, it's a little more complex because our endowment is composed of some funds that are restricted by the donor. So a donor may give $100,000 and say they want the proceeds of that endowment to be used only for the symphony, say, or only for theater. We have other components of the endowment that are unrestricted that somebody will give just for the general support of the institution. So where we have restricted funds, they can only be used by the institution if the institution undertakes activities that are consistent with the donor's wishes. So there may be years, for example, where certain funds aren't used because the institution isn't doing anything that qualifies for the use of those funds. That's a big issue this year, right, because we don't have the normal in-person summer seasons. So our ability to utilize some of those restricted funds to support the institution is more limited this year because there are less programmatic activities going on. Uh, are most of the assets held as bonds or stocks or what's this? Tell me, I want to dig into this one a little sure. bit. Sure, yeah. So we, we work with an outside investment advisor, a firm called Hurdle Callahan, who is um, known, they actually invented the notion of being an outsourced chief investment officer. So they work with a lot of 
foundations and endowments and, and uh, private family funds. Um, and they have a team of investment analysts who cover the spectrum. So stocks, bonds, private equity investments, real estate investments, um, uh, private equity, credit facilities, you know, a, a broad range. And we work with them to come up with a balanced investment portfolio that is intended to get us the returns that we need to be able to support the institution and maintain the sustainability of the endowment while also managing risk. I mean, frankly, we don't want a ton of volatility in the endowment because we want to know from year to year that we're going to be able to, to provide funds to the institution you know, within a range at, a, at the desired level. So we have to balance the need for strong enough returns to make those payouts with the need to limit risk so we don't experience a lot of volatility. Um, so that plays out in different ways. But if you look across our suite of investments, we're very well balanced across you know, large capital companies, small capital companies, US-based, international, different types of investments. And that's all geared towards trying to manage that risk so that we're, we're you know, putting ourselves in a strong position. You mentioned real estate. Um, do they have is this, uh, the whole actual buildings and land? There's a real estate investment trust? It's typically what? through real estate investment trust. That's right. Got it. Yeah. Got it. And um, that seems to work reasonably well over the years. What's been the growth rate of the, of the uh, endowment last few years before this catastrophe? Yeah, we'd actually done um, really well in the last several years. I mean, as, as most investment funds did, it was hard not to do well in, in the market over the last few yeah. years until recently. Um, so our returns have been strong, you know, over a relatively short period of time. The endowment increased from 80 million to over to just over 100 million. Um, a lot of that's driven by new gifts, but a lot was also driven by investment returns. And you know, even with the downturn that we've you know had as a result of COVID, or the downturns that we've had at other points in time, the fact is that being invested in the stock market and in some of the other vehicles that we're in, still over the long haul, which is how we have to think about the endowment is the right place to be. That's the only place you can generate the returns necessary to have payout and to maintain the value of the endowment. Got it, got it. Tell me about the foundation's organization. There's a board. How do you select people? What's the term? Meetings, sure. all that good stuff. Yeah, so that's actually changed a little bit over the last couple of years. It, it had been that the foundation was responsible for all of the development function for the institution. So raising money not only for endowment, but also for the annual fund, for you know, money that, that would come in and could be spent in that same year. Um, so that meant that the foundation was overseeing all of the institution's um, development staff. So the folks that were pursuing major gifts, the folks that were running the Chautauqua Fund, you know, the people writing the thank you notes and, and, and organizing the donor events and all of that. And we made a decision beginning about two years ago to transition those activities from the foundation back to the institution. And there's a good logic behind that. I mean, the idea was that the institution um, really was entering a new phase where it needed to uh, be able to stretch and, and push its philanthropic fundraising activities in ways that made sense in light of their strategic plan with the new president, Michael Hill, in place. The institution needed the flexibility to add development resources as it saw fit and to hold them accountable and frankly to tie them in more closely with the activities at the institution because when people give money they're not really giving to the foundation because of something the foundation is doing they're really giving to the institution because of the work that the institution does so to have the people responsible for raising that money more closely aligned with the institution made a lot of sense what that all means for the foundation is that our scope is really all around the endowment. And it's, it's three different things in the way I think about it. Um, one is to, and probably most importantly, is to manage the endowment assets, to, to you know, have that right mix of investments that lets us manage risk but have strong payouts. Um, the second is to do the payout calculations, to, to figure out each year how much we can afford to pay out to the institution, consistent with the desires and restrictions of our donors, and also consistent with the idea of keeping the endowment in perpetuity, so those funds are always there to support the institution. And then the third piece is to raise more endowment funds, because you know, at the foundation we really believe in the importance of endowment as one key way for sustaining the institution, especially through times like this, when you see what happened with COVID and how quickly expected revenues can dry up and disappear because people aren't coming through the gates, they aren't buying gate passes, having the stability and the predictability of endowment resources is really critical. So for us, 
helping to raise the endowment through our own efforts, through leveraging our networks, through gifts you know, from our board. Uh, all of those are really important aspects of helping to demonstrate the importance of endowment and, and increasing it. And how is the board selected? How long does it want to serve? Sure. Um, so we, we have a, a board that can be up to 20 people. It's currently at 18 people, and uh, the size can vary in part based on our needs. We've got a nominating and gov governance committee that helps to define you know, what are the attributes of the board that we'd like to have. So given what our mission and focus is, what's the right complement of people and skill sets and attributes that we need on our board to effectively carry out our duties and to do that in a way that brings in as many different voices and perspectives from all of the different sub-segments of Chautauqua and of, of you know, the larger society um, so we get the benefit of all of that skill and knowledge in, in doing you know, what we need to do. So we define what those skill sets are, we take stock of who we have on our board currently and how that matches up with our needs and then think about where the gaps are, where we have needs that are currently unmet or where we could use more resources, and then try to cast a broad net to find people that can fill those needs and help us you know, strengthen the board. So our nominating governance committee goes through that process. They identify the candidates. Our board looks at them, and then we propose those to the members of the Chautauqua Corporation, which are the people, uh, or the members of the foundation, rather, who are the people who have given to the endowment in the past. And they actually formally ratify the, the selection of those directors for our board. We don't have term limits, so people can serve indefinitely, but they serve in terms um, four years at a time. And so um, each four years, they're up for re-election and can choose to continue on or not to. We typically don't have many people who resign midterm. People usually will, will carry through, and we've got a number of members that have been on the board for quite a long time because they're bringing a ton of value to the process. Good, good. Now, is um, look with the institution, its basic document is a act by the state legislature, now well over a century old. What's the basic document for the board? Um, we also have articles of incorporation that, that define our mission as being primarily for the support of the Chautauqua Institution. So. While we maintain that separation I told you about in order to protect those endowment assets, you know, we're also obviously very closely aligned with the institution. And, and sometimes that means that the foundation has played the role of, of an, another voice, sometimes a counterbalance to some of the, the plans and the activities within the institution. Um, but more typically, especially in recent years, really kind of working in close coordination with the institution. So mm -hmm. as the institution's trustees look at a new strategic plan, for example, you know, we're very close to that process as well because the endowment is generally you know, viewed as part of that strategy. And thinking about the endowment assets that are needed to execute that strategy is an important place where we both need to be in sync. Got it. Got it. A little different. Uh, question here. Sure. What major changes has the institution made in its spending in response to this pandemic? Yeah, so th it, it's, it, it was a really difficult process this spring figuring out what the institution's finances might look like. And as you can imagine, you know, when COVID first hit, no one knew how things were going to unfold. So we were doing sort of two-track planning, thinking about, you know, what would, it, you know, what would a normal season look like and needing to have in place the plans and the budgets you know, for that if we were able to have a full season, as everyone hoped we would. Um, but at the same time, we had to be contingency planning, and, and there wasn't a lot of time to come up with a plan B. That plan B ended up being what we've gone forward with, which is the online CHQ assembly virtual convening this summer. And it's a drastically different model. So you know, if the original budget contemplated that we would have $25 million, give or take, of earned revenue from people who actually come through the gates, buy a gate pass, pay parking, you know, go to the restaurants and the hotel and all that. Um, that's down to $4 million now this year because it was that dramatic of an impact. So we saw big reductions on the revenue side. Fortunately, the, 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 you know, while the earned revenue took a big hit, philanthropy really hasn't. It's down a little bit in our budget from what we were expecting it to be this year, just again because people are suffering through this crisis and that has an impact. But philanthropy is really sustaining what we are doing. If you look at the cost side of things, um, our, we've reduced about $11 million out of the cost side of the equation for the institution. 
So what that means is that you know we're not paying for all of the performing and visual arts that we would have before. Um, we still pay for things like symphony under our contract, but negotiated a lesser amount to be paid this year in light of the fact that the symphony can't perform in the amphitheater. So a lot of work was done to reduce costs while still trying to maintain relationships with the artists, while still trying to maintain the structure and, and motivation of the staff. And so there's a balancing act. You know, fortunately, the institution had strong cash reserves and some help from the federal government through the payroll protection program that helped to bridge that gap. But still, the institution is on track to, to lose nine and a half million dollars this year net net as a result of, of COVID. Um, we're strong enough to come through that and you know, God willing, we'll have a, a strong season next year that will help make up for some of that. But it's, uh, it was definitely a big unexpected hit for the year. And that's tough. Let's, let's finalize things here. We've got two minutes left. All right. And the question I always like to ask at the end, and, and look at young people at Chautauqua as being, being um, immensely important. And if a young Chautauquan would come to you and express an interest in financial consulting for the healthcare industry, what would you counsel? Ah, um, well, I'll tell you a couple of things. First, you know, as a career path, I think it's a great one um, for a couple of reasons. You know, healthcare affects everybody. You know, if you're in the healthcare industry, you have something to talk about with anybody at a cocktail party or anywhere else you might go. Um, a career, particularly in the financial side of healthcare, is something that's unlikely to get outsourced. I mean, we need good, smart people who understand how to reduce costs, how to, you know, perform better quality care for less cost to the, to the you know, system overall. And so there's a ton of opportunity inside of that. Preparing yourself for that, you know, there's a lot of different ways to, to contribute. You know, within healthcare, we need people who are strong data analysts. We need people who are strong with financial skills and, and building financial models. We need people with strong legal skills, strong clinical skills. So there are any number of different ways that a skill set and an interest can play out in this industry. Um, but the fact is there's so many opportunities and it's such a large and complex industry that there's plenty of opportunities. So my suggestion is always figure out what you like and what you're good at within your own you know, sphere of skills and you can marry that up in some way with, with healthcare that will be really productive, really satisfying and I think a very stable and, and you know, long-term career. Great. Any parting comments, things we didn't, didn't cover? <laughs> Uh, no, I'll, I'll just say, you know, it's been a joy to well, be on the show with you and to be part of life in Chautauqua County for going on 20 years now. It's, it's meant a lot to our family and it's just great to be a part of this scene. Fantastic. We are out of time and this is a different day. We have a shorter table. I reach over and shake your hand. <laughs> All right. We'll but give you a little elbow it. bump instead. We are through. Right. Thank you so very much. Yeah, and do, you, this has been fun and do come back. Good. I'd love to. Thanks.